guys. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, Hello? sir. You are audible. Audible, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sir, sir, we are having this. This we are having this webinar on methane emissions, opportunities, and challenges in agriculture and livestock sector. And we we welcome to all the panelists and distinguished panelists, and also to Professor Vashne who will lead this this session. Who will lead the session? Who will concretize? and make this some final concrete point for discussion in guwahati on 1st of february so basically the the dr sudeep mitra ji also there abhishek jain is also there vishwajit mandal is not coming and dr arti bhatia is there so i hand over the floor to the professor vashne i just one one little thing i wanted to share that paddy crop paddy cultivation is india is work out to be around 50 million hectare and this produces methane about 4 to 5.4 teragrams teragrams of methane and regarding this the exa foundation had a one 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 function at the cotton raiser on 20th of september which was inaugurated by the by the nitin gadkari ji honorable substance transport minister and fourth november we had a one session on oil and gas sector methane emission from oil and gas sector then we are planning to have agriculture livestock on 1st of february then 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 the transport sector then the waste waste sector and the mining and coal coal bed methane gas sector so the recommendation of all the sector once conducted all these all these events will be forwarded to the some ministry of environment and the concerned agencies and the and the road map will be prepared by the will, will be prepared by the exa foundation and submit to the concerned agency to make the climate net zero and other emissions so thank you very much i have handed over the floor to the professor watner thank you dr sharma for taking this initiative by this ka foundation which my mind is very critical for the future development of agriculture which is benign climatically friendly and able to support and help the food security of the country now as the program goes we have dr sudeep professor sudeep mitra from iit guwahati to provide the background and the introductory uh, aspect of this and after that i would like to really make little alteration in the list of speaker and i would request dr arti bhartia to come on as i understand that she has some commitment after this so before that i would request uh, professor uday uh professor sandeep mitra to give us the no i'm sorry this is uday vardi who has to give a climate uh, smart agriculture background and provide the backdrop to this uday vardi thank you sir thanks a lot uh, very good evening everyone uh, Uh, welcome to the esteemed uh, panelists i hope i'm audible i'll yes, just continue uh, very much yeah great great uh, my name is uday vardi and i work in the space of climate smart agriculture thanks a lot for taking out this time uh, for this initiative to discuss the methane emissions the opportunities and challenges in the agriculture sector um of the unholy trinity of greenhouse gases we know the carbon dioxide methane and nitrous oxide and specifically in the order methane forms the second most abundant greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide now it is a claim to be 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide at warming the atmosphere now methane is single handedly responsible and attributed for almost a quarter of global warming since the industrial uh, revolution and today around 50% of methane emissions globally are uh, recorded as anthropogenic largely from agriculture waste and the waste generation and the fossil fuel production and consumption while it is relatively easier to track the leakages and perform measurements in the energy sector agriculture poses a unique challenge in measuring the same especially in a massive geological uh, landscape such as india uh, it is it is uh, quite wide and you know geographically if you look at it it comprises of uh, 
a couple of countries. Now, it is widely known that paddy cultivation and livestock, these are the two major important sources of uh, methane pollution and methane emissions. Now, methane emission in the country could be attributed to paddy, but of course, it's also a staple for around 60% of the country's population. At the same time, livestock is a livelihood resource, an important livelihood resource for majority of the population of the masses. Now, majority of Indian farmers are small and marginal, around 80% of them. And changing climatic conditions, uh, call it erratic rainfall patterns, changing seasonality conditions, uh, uh, changing adaptive factors, all of these actually make crop productivity unreliable. Well, the onus of livelihood and food security of such a large population lies on the country. And when the development of the country is intertwined with the health and well-being of such a large number of people, uh, responses to these challenges should be measured and calibrated. And that is one of the pertinent reasons why methane emissions are categorized as survival emissions. Now, if one looks at the life cycle analysis of methane, the challenges, uh, rather opportunities, I'd call them, uh, are immense. Now, opportunities not just to manage external but also systemic ones this could you know uh, we could extend it to upstream you know value chain inputs to downside channels that includes the production of all the inputs to you know the supply of all the you know uh, final outputs now in all of these the calibrated response to these options should be our priority and we should ensure that mitigation of these methane uh, emissions uh, could be done while ensuring uh, other important greenhouse gases such as nitrous oxide uh, are also taken into consideration. Now, to this end, this webinar on methane emissions will focus on the following objectives. One, to support a platform uh, and establish a platform for scientific engagement on methane emissions. Uh, second is to uh, understand and uh, provide opportunities and challenges in agriculture sector with a focus on specific focus on science and technology technology, I'm sorry. And the third one and most important is to bring uh, such an esteemed and uh, august body of panels, both national and international members onto the field to actually, uh, you know, discuss all of these issues very, very thoroughly. Now with that, I uh, give it back to Professor Varshney for his uh, comments. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think it is very important that uh, methane measurement and uh, precise understanding of the <clears throat> methane emission is uh, critical before any prescription can be designed to contain it. And uh, as the landscape is very heterogeneous, as well as the cultivation methods are so varied and wide that uh, the climate uh, fluctuation makes it even more difficult and more complex to really say that if you make an assessment for a year A, will this be valid for the year B? It is not possible because the situation keeps on changing with the climate. And it is the amount of water on the soil which is an important determinant of methane emission. And thus it becomes a very complex system to make a precise measurement. However, there are many areas on which work is required and some work is already going on to really contain the methane emission within the sector of agriculture and more particularly paddy cultivation, both in terms of nitrous oxide as well as in terms of methane emission. Now, before we really move further, and I, as I've said that I have altered the scheme on the request of one of our panelists, Dr. Uh, Professor Arti Bhartia, because she has some other sudden engagement in our institution. So I will now request Dr. Arti Bhartia to give us that what are those insights and what are those strategies by which we can reduce methane emission from paddy cultivation, more particularly from the point of view that which are the gap areas where additional input of science and technology is needed and not only needed that what are the strategies for doing this? and what it will involve in terms of training people or in terms of social change or in terms of the practices that our farmers are adopting now and what need to be done. So with this, I will not really take much time, but will request 
डॉक्टर आरती भारतीया टू गिव अस हर इंफॉर्मेशन एंड हर व्यू पॉइंट ऑन दीज एस्पेक्ट्स थैंक यू वेरी मच सर so uh, esteemed panelists uh, i am a researcher at uh, indian agriculture research institute and a principal scientist here and working in the area of greenhouse gas measurement from rice and other agriculture soil for the last 25 years so i have done a lot of research about you know mitigating greenhouse gas emissions from uh, rice as well as besides like methane as uh, uday said you know it is the other gases also so like nitrous oxide so we can't just talk about uh, methane uh, you know singularly so when we talk about uh, rice so we'll have to talk about the whole the net uh, global warming potential so because there are certain practices you know which we have studied and which may lead to the increase in emission of the other gases so basically a trade off approach has to be worked out and uh, like you know the research work that has been carried out has been as you all know rice is grown in different ecologies we have upland rice which contributes to no methane then we have lowland and in uh, lowland rain fed is there lowland irrigated is there then we have deep water and we have you know uh, what is it called uh, mm, uh, continuously the submerged rice so we have uh, different according to some ipcc uh, classification and other you know the ministry of environment and forest based classification and agriculture ministry based classification there are different classifications are there but overall mitigation is possible primarily like you know in your irrigated uh, uh, rice ecologies because when we go for mitigation in a rain fed environment so rain fed rice wherever it is gone it is not possible to go in for uh, you know a mitigation there so uh, some studies are there that in rain fed ecologies because you cannot control the water there so the possibility of mitigating methane from a rain fed uh, ecology which is like you know you have rain fed rice being grown in our eastern part so primarily orissa west bengal we have deep water and we have uh, uh, this thing <clears throat> rain fed uh, these are the areas and here in these areas orissa west bengal the emission factors the emission factors of rice cultivation are very much higher so they are kind of hot spot areas for uh, methane now if we want to do mitigation in these particular areas then uh, irrigation management is not the thing because we generally say that you know moving from flooded rice going to intermittent wetting and drying is one of the approaches but that is an approach for your uh, irrigated rice and in that approach also you know the the farmer the far, there is a yield penalty there is a yield penalty of approximately at least if we go for 5% you know if we move from continuous flooded to irrigated rice so this yield penalty has to be somehow you have to uh, you know bridge this yield gap because of the change in irrigation and that can be made with the help of you know if we more, uh, input more maybe you know nitrogenous fertilizer but if we going for more nitrogenous fertilizer then it will lead to an increase in the nitrous oxide emissions so we'll have to go in for a slow release coated fertilizer or you know some fertilizer which like nitrific line now neem oil coated urea is there but besides neem oil coated urea you will have to go because neem oil coated urea we have seen that increases the ammonia volatilization losses so you know that is another aspect which is contributing to indirect uh, n2 emissions so you have direct emissions of n2 you have indirect so there is a, it's not a simplistic approach that we can go for yes one measure or you know second measure we will have to go for a, a regional approach wherein you will have to go slowly steadily any approach cannot be singular for the whole of the country you is somewhere there is system of rice intensification somewhere there is direct seeded rice approach we can go for a drip fertigation but it will have to be specifically targeted you know for this particular ecology we can go for these are the measures so the, we would be requiring much more detailed approach and all these will lead to you know some bit of uh, if it leads to a yield penalty then the farmer has to be compensated and for that you know this nowadays we are having this carbon uh, farming and carbon credits that are coming so we need to have uh, what is it called 
this particular approach, we need to have our own country specific carbon market. So the farmer producer organizations, the, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, the, uh, this, the, there are few, some startups are also coming. So private sector also has to come in a big way so that the benefit, you know, farmer should not be penalized. And if it, he goes for any practice of direct seeding or he goes for aerobic rice, then he has to be supported in some way. If there is a reduction, there are well-known technologies which need to be uh, like, you know, in, in implemented, but then the farmer has to be compensated somehow so that if he's generating some carbon credits, he should be paid, you know, a good sum for it. So we need to have our own carbon uh, market here. So I, I just want to say that, you know, global warming potential, like he was saying, it's 25 but that is on a 100-year time horizon. If we say in the next 20 years, methane has a much higher global warming potential. So go something like 70, 80, that becomes. So it's very much essential that we go in for a reduction, but that reduction will be uh, agroecology based, you know, and it is not going to be the sim uh, same kind of uh, approach everywhere. So some, uh, some ex uh, maybe a campaign kind of a thing can be done wherein uh, uh, different measures are uh, uh, taken in, at, at different locations. So a networking kind of an approach to see that how best what practices like you have biochar instead of crop residue implemented biochar. Now biochar is not affected in all type of rice. Biochar along with the intermittent rice is seen to be reducing the methane. But if you go for biochar in, area, in continuously flooded, it might increase the methane. So... And uh, the acidic soil, alkaline soil, so different factors are there. So, you know, a little more detailed study would be required to see what kind of approach would be um, good for a particular uh, rice ecology. So that is what I just want to say. Thank you. <clears throat> but could you just elaborate that what exact or specific research is to be done. These are in very general okay. terms. Sir, like, because, uh, you know, because we, we, cannot, have... we cannot make any recommendation in these very general terms. For, uh, so we uh, have to have a very precise, uh, some kind of a formulation which gives the direction. Or it okay. Shows so, some... uh, yeah, so I would like to say that there is one nowadays an upcoming technology of microbial mitigation. So you have some biofertilizers and some plant growth promoting bacteria now, these are the ones, they are methanotropic in nature. So, if we have an implementation in the rain-fed uh, rice areas of these kind of formulations, then it will be a win-win situation, not only for methane, but also for nitrous oxide, because water management is not possible there. In our northwestern area of rice cultivation, southern areas, we can go for direct seeding of rice, aerobic rice, along with drip fertigation. So, that those, those areas, that can be implemented. So, uh, and uh, like, like alternate wetting and drying along with the drip, uh, uh, drip area, area, like you can go for drip fertigation, alternate wetting and drying, aerobic rice for the northwestern uh, region of the country and the southern region. And for eastern parts of the country where it's all rain fed, then we, we can go in for uh, the microbial mitigation as well as, uh, uh, like I said, acidic soils are there, their biochar plays a big role. Uh, increasing, uh, applying biochar leads to a uh, decline in the emissions and increasing the carbon sequestration capacity. So these are the few measures and more details. Like said, I was not knowing that today we are going to have such a elaborate this thing. It was told five minutes. So it is, a, you know, a big, uh, you need much more time, much more. So I, I could have worked yeah. that out. But Currently, I can say this. And also, like I said, we need to have an approach for the carbon market. So that is very much essential. Okay, thank you. I think uh, now we can uh, request uh, Dr. Sandeep Mitra, whom I have really bypassed because of uh, Dr. Aarti's uh, predicament. And I request him to kindly give us his... Uh, insight into the problem of methane emission from agriculture sector, from the rice paddies and the related management issues. Professor Sandeep Mitra. 
Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, very much. Uh, first of all, sir, namaskar. And good to see you, sir, after JNU days. So, uh, you, you may be knowing that I actually was uh, very next to your office. Office actually, I was given by Doctor Saxena when I joined in you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Very well. Uh, and uh, uh, sir, I hope that you will be uh, at my campus. Yes, I will. Be. I first. will. Be. Yes, and I will be very happy to uh, meet you there. Yes. Sure. Uh, so thank you once again uh, uh, to to Ixa Foundation for arranging this uh, uh, kind of a prelude to the February one. Uh, that is how uh, i think uh, i have been told and i think that that's a good idea but certainly as as uh, arti ma'am has told already that today's meeting cannot be uh, uh, kind of a uh, meeting to come out with some strategic i think that is for february one we need to wait um, because we are going to get uh, many people Uh, the you know IRI Pusa, and we started the very first experiment of methane estimation. That was kind of a, a fight for uh, you know respect. Professor A P Mitra, C S R, ex director, you all probably know that he was his team was the first team, and we were part of that uh, with Dr. D C Parashar and and my chair person, Professor M C Jain. so the very first experiment uh, was started at iri and as i said that that was a kind of a to disprove the american special us epa uh, you know uh, measurement i don't know how they measured it such a huge amount of methane coming out of agriculture sector especially rice paddy field so anyway we have come now in the last 30 years a long way time has changed so the technology has changed and so the issue as well so as as you said that we need to uh, you know talk few issues important issues and technology well, i would just like briefly mention about that so uh, as also uh, the uh, first speaker has mentioned a uh, couple of uh, uh, data i think that the simplest one that we should remember is that we are having talking about uh, some something some issue which is 145 teragram methane per year so this is the total uh, uh, volume of methane which is if you compared with many other uh, fossil fuel based sector is not much but having said that 31 tons of methane is emitted from rice paddy and which is responsible around 9% of the total anthropogenic emission output so here we have actually because if we are the region of this problem for this 9% then we have certainly some role to play and uh, just to mention that if we want to play a role uh, in the field of agriculture so there are two major aspect it is not only rice paddy or crop uh, you know sector but it is also livestock sector so uh, two sector that i feel that we need to look at uh, from technological point of view from social point of view and also from political point of view because without that i think that we cannot be able to implement many of our discussion that we are having today or we will have on february 1 coming to the first uh, the sector is the livestock i think that uh, there are two aspect that which uh, uh, we can act research professor vasne has asked for some research topic i think that feed quality and the uh, and the additives nature of additives in the livestock feed quality yeah the future research for methanation will be you know a, a kind of a hot topic and if you if you look at the, the recent papers in high impact factor journals across the world people have started now looking in deep into the nature of additives that we are putting in the feed of livestock that's one area the second area of research i feel that uh, one can actually concentrate is the manure management so these are the two major sector according to me for livestock that methane emission uh, you know uh, 
maintenance that we can actually carry out. Now let us come to the other part, which is the cropping sector, and that's paddy, which is the major crop responsible for methane, which is very three to four teragram per year. But still, I think that there are a lot of uh, uh, diversified ways that we can have a regulation of methane from paddy. Because as all of you know, uh, as I told that myself uh, already, it is going to be 30 years. Uh, the Arti Madam told, I still remember that, uh, that we were there actually at IRI when we were working. Uh, so she joined also the team. To name few that research areas which have been carried out, but a lot can be done is the cultivar choice. So some varieties that we need to go for breeding or maybe even biotechnology, where we can have more production, but less em emission. So that could be one way. Second, I, I think that not much research has been carried out. Some of research has been carried out in the, uh, you know, uh, Scandinavian country. I also find a couple of reports recently coming out of a few lab from California, is that capturing of methane from the agricultural field. We have always heard about carbon capturing, but time has come probably we can also capture methane. So that could be another line of research. And that the third, that line in the cropping sector that I think uh, that I myself will be very much interested in my lab in IIT, we are doing, we started already with PhD research, is the you know uh, application of different biofertilium of of uh, beneficial bacteria, as well as some other sources of biomaterials. So in our lab, uh, uh, when you, you guys come in Guwahati, I will show you that we are com combining biochars, which are coming for again from crop residue. So instead of burning those residue, convert into biochar and then in composition of various bacteria, that could be a new way, uh, path to do it. We are doing on that research and also the National Rice Research Institute, Kotak, also doing this research. So this is another area which is going on and need more research input into that. So uh, as uh, Professor Vasne asked, so I, I had this, this uh, very brief uh, future that research areas and input into two sector of agriculture that could be done. Now to end uh, my interjection here, I would say again, because I am a little bit selfish here, because I am looking forward to the February 1 meeting uh, you know, uh, a very uh, effective one so that we can come out with some, uh, you know, white paper out of that and give it to the government. Anthropogenic methane emission, I think that the recent research has, has been saying, and also with a little bit of confidence, that somewhere around 45% uh, we can be able to reduce in the coming one decade. And that's a quite significant target. And also, if you see that, that these 45%, if we can reduce in the coming one decade, it will definitely help the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade, that control regulation we can bring it. And that's how we can also adhere to the Paris Agreement. So I, I stop it here. Over to you, Basne, sir. Thank you very much for giving your insight, uh, Professor Sandeep Mitra. And surely this is an area which requires much deeper and much closer understanding as to how we can really deal with the, I should say, the methane emission problem from the, and the more interesting point that you made is that how we can collect, and if we are able to collect it successfully from the paddy fields, then I think it is possible to really provide some economic benefit to the farmer because after all this is an energy source and can be utilized and for which certain realizations will be possible but the technology and the input cost and other things have to be worked out as to how this can be done especially in our case where small holdings are there and it is difficult for really having a cooperative understanding among the neighboring fields to really provide this kind of a facility and to transport it to the areas of consumption. Anyway, this is something which has to be looked at. And as we will be able to identify the problem, I'm sure that we will be moving towards the path of solution. 
So I think with that, I will request uh, Dr. Abhishek Jain from CEW uh, to really give us his uh, uh, vision about the issues and about the challenges that we face with respect to agriculture sector and more particularly with respect to the paddy cultivation that we have on a such an extensive scale and which is a part of our social fabric in this country within urban setting. And also it is importantly, equally important for our rural setting where actually the rice is produced. Because on rice, there is a lot of commercial activity also that is taking place. We are exporting it and it is contributing to the country's exchequer. So I think it is a part of our social fabric and our culture which has uh, really provided the food security to the Southeast Asian countries and to which we also look in future for our own food security in the country. Dr. Abhishek Jain. Uh, Thank you. Sir, sir uh, sorry, just one minute. I have to take uh, leave because I am here at Tiruchira Poli attending Indian Sci uh, Social Science Congress. And the program is going to just inaugurate it now. If you okay. give, allow me, I will just uh, go and join the program now. Here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Sir, I will also have to leave the meeting now. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak here. But I will, but I will suggest, madam, that uh, please forward us in writing few strategies and the items on priority that need to be tackled sure. for research. Sure, sir. And sure. If, we can, if we can do it in a next uh, one or two days, then I think that will be a great input for the meeting, which is forthcoming at Guwahati. Okay, sir. Sure. Definitely, I'll do that. Sir. Please forward it to Dr. Mr. Ms. Sony. Okay, thank Please. you. I, I'll do that. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Abhishek Jain. Great. Thank you, Professor Vashne. Yeah, uh, I mean, you mentioned about uh, uh, paddy and food being part of social uh, and socioeconomic fabric, very much so. I think that's the role that food plays. Uh, but let me start with dairy first, because uh, that's where our bulk of the methane emissions are. No, I must, I must make a small mention, please don't mind. We had a similar meeting a few days ago where we have talked about the cattle and the dairy. Okay, then so, we can so focus if on the you, if you, if, if, No, no, you are free to make your observation on that. If you have something that uh, really you think that uh, is our upper mind, but I think we would like to hear more about this as well as of paddy, uh, of the cattle and the dairy industry in this subsequent as your footnote or addition to what you are going to talk about sure. paddy. Let me then first talk about paddy. Uh, I think uh, some of the preceding speakers very well pointed out this issue, which is a little bit of a tension between methane and uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, and that to me is like quite central the moment we are looking at paddy emissions, because uh, if we only focus on methane emission, we will end up probably worsening the situation than what it is today. Uh, methane is about 28 times more potent than CO2, but nitrous oxide emissions are... Uh, almost uh, 12 times more potent than methane itself. So it is far more potent. I mean, it is almost 300 times more potent than CO2. And uh, unlike methane, which has a environmental life cycle in the atmosphere of about 12 years, nitrous oxide emissions actually remain in the environment for more than 100 years, so more than actually CO2. So that's why we need to be very cautious that the moment we are talking about paddy methane, we cannot just talk about paddy methane, we need to talk about paddy methane and nitrous oxide together. Uh, because in most cases, if methane comes down, you would see nitrous oxide emissions going up. Uh, and that would only worsen the situation, both in the short as well as in the long run for us. That was the first point I wanted to make. I think some earlier speakers tried to uh, allude to this point, but probably uh, emphasis is required because otherwise we will uh, short change the real goal that we have to uh, mitigate climate emissions, not just mitigate methane. Uh, that's what is important, I think. Uh, that is first. Uh, second, uh, in addition to what has been already covered, so I'll try to keep some of the points which are which have not come up so far. Uh, and one point is like, uh, how can we maximize the production of rice from the limited area so that we can diversify more area towards other crops? Uh, 
because the methane emissions are mostly a factor of the area not a factor of the production uh, if you have better productivity your specific emissions are actually going to come down so per kg paddy output the specific emissions come down so how can we focus on better productivity in areas where we have really low productivity because there is a huge spectrum from west india to east india or especially northwest india to the central eastern india you see a huge spectrum uh, in terms of the productivity ranges so if we can focus on areas where the productivity is low and make sure that they are producing more uh, rice per hectare but at the same time more rice per kg of methane or per kg of nitrox oxide that will very nicely align the economic as well as the environmental goal but at the same time whatever land that we are displacing from uh, uh, paddy that needs to be diversified into few uh, important uh, cash crops and crops that are important for the country from a nutrition perspective you're not going to ask uh, a farmer that okay please diversify uh, your land from paddy to xyz because it is good for the environment no farmer is going to do that uh, it has to make sense for the farmer from an economic perspective even in the absence of i would argue a carbon price or a carbon uh, credit that we can provide uh, so i mean we know that in this country the micronutrient deficiencies are pretty high uh, the per capita consumption of fruits and vegetables is pretty low uh, that is one significant opportunity to diversify from paddy to uh, horticulture uh, in several areas in the country uh, of course what we need to solve there is uh, the post harvest infrastructure because that's where horticulture sort of struggles uh, the second thing uh, on diversification is to also look at uh, uh, not just diversification necessarily to other crops but other crops and agroforestry uh, i think that is one area which has been quite less tapped into both from a an economic and environmental perspective the agroforestry diversifies the income for the farmer but at the same time uh, so essentially makes the income resilient while increasing the income plus also sequesters a lot more carbon from the atmosphere uh, so again a likely win win situation if we diversify to alternative crops along with agroforestry now, what other alternative crops beyond horticulture uh, particularly oil seeds and pulses because these are two where we are significantly import dependent so our nutrition security is also at risk because uh, uh, i mean much like micronutrient our protein intake is also less so how do we ensure that more pulses and more oil seeds are uh, being grown where we are currently import dependent so our uh, uh, nutrition security uh, which is linked to the national security comes under threat as a result so that is what i would say in terms of uh, how we are looking at uh, some extent addressing the methane emissions from the paddy uh, side uh, not necessarily say that okay we should grow less paddy but grow paddy in less area uh, and use the area towards uh, other things so that we address both nitrous oxide as well as methane emission uh, together uh, rather than coming in this tension between the two but of course whatever area would be under paddy that still needs to be addressed through uh, approaches that uh, rtg has already uh, laid out uh, now maybe if i can quickly add uh, on the dairy and the cattle bit uh, i had not uh, understood that the focus was only uh, paddy earlier uh, i would say there uh, the challenges are even uh, more diffi uh, difficult in many ways uh, than uh, uh, paddy emissions uh, because of the heterogeneity of the animal population in this country uh, we talk about indigenous animal as one category but there are huge variations within the indigenous animal from again uh, west to east Uh, from very small animals in the eastern india to reasonably large animals in the eastern india just within india and then while there are recognized breeds about 40 of them there are so many non descript breeds uh, that are out there uh, and the variations are significant when it comes to emission factors so if there is one research that need to happen more is more and more studies around emission factors uh, of the indian animals across the category uh, but having said that i think what is also not uh, quantified enough is the different motivations of animal keeping in this country uh, we are keeping uh, i mean there are farmers who are keeping animals for profit maximization there are farmers who are keeping animal for risk minimization uh, where many a times there is no marketable surplus but you are keeping the animal also in many cases as a way of life 
now an approach to intervene with a farmer who is ma maximizing their profit is very different from an approach to intervene with a farmer who is just keeping it as a way of life or risk minimization strategy uh, food uh, the feed additives may not work in many of those cases because many of those cattle rearers are not even using formal feed they are primarily relying on uh, grazing and uh, crop residues uh, etc so uh, understanding that heterogeneity and sort of mapping it more explicitly is what we are trying to do right now through a primary much larger primary data gathering exercise across 10 states in india so that we can actually tell like after district state after state how the interventions need to be shaped in order to reduce uh, not just methane emissions but also improve farmer income and enhance nutrition security uh, let me stop there and happy to come back in the q and as as required thank you thank you I think uh, now the floor is open, and uh, we anyone from the audience would like to share any experience or any thought on this issue of methane in agriculture sector, more particularly in the paddy cultivation and other agriculture operations. So, good evening, uh, Professor. <laughs> good evening, good evening, Doctor Rakesh. Good, good evening. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And thank yeah, you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> it's a pleasure to listen to uh, you know some of the experts in this area, and I was uh, I was amazed at the range of problem that we have in this sector. I I think the basic question which you I think you alluded to in the beginning is that uh, all the emission factors which have been used um, by by the researcher in India as well as outside who have estimated for India. How far they are accurate, and where is the where is the uh, you know gap? Uh, I wanted to uh, you know get this that sense from uh, Dr. Bhat Arthi Bhatia and and the gentleman from CU who, who spoke very well. Uh, any any sense of it? Are we too off or are we too close? Because this is a debate which is unending. I'm I'm sure emission factors can never be 100% accurate. But are we are we uh, are we needing more research to do this, or is the structure which is not looking right? I think this is a very important issue which uh, Dr. Rakesh Ji has raised. That uh, we take some international factors or some ratios, and then we calculate methane emission on the basis of acreage which uh, I think uh, this uh, little meeting has brought out very effectively that things are not same. Across the India, we have got different territories with different practices and different uh, climatic conditions in which rice and paddy is grown. And therefore, to really calculate them as one and uh, applying it with the simply by acreage or whatever it is or the production is not the correct way of doing it. I think this is very, very important. Unless we have a very accurate picture, I think solutions cannot be developed or prescriptions cannot be generated. So I think this is a very important issue that how do we have a proper assessment, whether it is 7% of the total global warming or it is 5% or even less than 5%. And it is a survival you know, emission, which is very, very important and critical. And uh, not only that, it provides livelihood to the people. Now, about rice, there are few facts about which people are uh, sometimes miss the point. Rice primarily is not an aquatic plant. It tolerates aquatic or I should say anaerobic condition very well. This is number one. Secondly, that the planting techniques that we are having are really correct with respect to minimizing methane emission under normal paddy cultivation operations. This is another important point on which very little information is available. That the current and the traditional practices of paddy cultivation are the optimum way of growing rice as well as reducing methane and nitrous oxide. So this is another. And the important point is that we have got now the soil health cards, which means that we know that how much nitrogenous fertilizer is needed. And if the farmer is sprinkling 
randomly because his parents and his uh, family has been doing like that then you know there are two things happening and one is on one hand which has a very high global warming potential or that same time that much of the ni nitrogen fertilizer that is put is not absorbed as not in the field but also becomes a source of nitrous oxide so i think these are two sources one because of the paddy cultivation and the other which really gets distributed in the environment and becomes ultimately uh, the loading on the nitrous oxide budget so i think these are the very important issues that we have to think about we have also to see that uh, rice plant has to spend lot of energy in terms of succeeding in this anaerobic environment can this energy be channelized to the grain filling and more productivity rather than really allowing this uh, anaerobic condition in the field i think there was a there is a question and i would like this uh, question to be raised uh, thakur and how the system of rice intensification contribute i think rice intensification sri as it is known which is being tested and many places have uh, given very useful and very encouraging results both in terms of low input in cultivation of rice the input cost gets reduced to a considerable degree the amount of water that is needed per unit of rice production also decreases substantially and at that same time the productivity increases in a significant way so i think these are the three things for this country water is in shortage and rice paddy cultivation in a conventional style particularly in the lowland areas we have this problem of ground water depletion and that increases the cost and the burden on the farmers uh, production schedule so i think if you require less water and if you require less amount of money in terms of input or the seed cost because 10 it is 10% of the total seed cost which can really take care of the entire hectare of land as compared to the conventional seed requirement so i think 1/10 of the seed cost 1/10 or 30% of the water that is needed and i think sri has proved that about 8 to 7 times production can increase so i think on one hand we have increased the production and in future let us be very clear that for the growing population we will require more and more of the agriculture production so the question of reducing the rice cultivation is not something that we can take very easily and can prescribe blindly i think crop diversification is very important and i think now the government of india is also emphasizing on natural cultivation which means that it is not the monoculture but it is the mixed culture and it is the agroforestry these are the things which need to be plugged in along with many other important consideration so i will say that uh, there are huge possibilities but at the same time i must hasten to say that research on these aspect in our country is rather limited and lacking so i think there are many areas on which i think the rice anatomy itself and also the question of uh, uh, how much water is to be provided and i have not been able to find if somebody can add that when you grow rice by the method of sri what are the methane we know good data production you know good amount of data which have been verified from various sources along uh, all over the world tropical world that less water is required we have also very reliable data or multiple data which shows from different scale reduced but what we don't have that under this method how much methane is evolved these are the conventional method so i consider this is a very important 
upland rice has no problem, which is about 50 ton rice cultivation area of about uh, 397 million hectares or something like that, lakh hectares. So 15% is gone. Then summer's rice is very different kind of a treatment that is needed and where more thinking has to be required. And the last point that I would like to say that I am recalled of my student days when I was a student at VHU. And there, the rice paddies were very important items of discussion from the point of view of algae that grows in the rice field. Mm -hmm. Because this algae is a nitrogen fixing algae. And it is not one species of algae, but it is a, I should say, a consortia of nitrogen fixing blue green algae. So they provide the nitrogen. At the same time, they are very active producers of oxygen. So I think the kind of, uh, you know, in a volume of uh, water, or I think the amount of water that stands from close to the ground, it is highly anaerobic. Then gradually, the oxygen tension keeps on decreasing. And at the surface, because of the wind and other factors, you find that the water, the upper layers of the water are oxygenated. So I think there's a lot of nitrogen as well as methane, which is evolving through ebullition other than from the plant. So I think the plant, which is, serves as a conduit for these pipes, for the emit, these gases to emit, but at the same time, the body of water. So if we have these nitrogen fixing blue green algae, then we help two things. Number one, that we are providing in C2 in moderate quantities of nitrogen, which are provided and therefore the outside and the wastage of fertilizer is reduced. And secondly, that they provide much more oxygenated water during the day, which to my mind is a very major contribution. In those days, methane was not an issue. So BHU has not looked into this, but have made extensive studies on these scum of green color that comes in the paddy fields and which contributes significantly to the biomass as well as to the oxygen evolution and to the nitrogen fixation in the rice paddies. So I think uh, these are very important uh, elements which have to be looked at very carefully. How many of them are going to be practical is another issue, but I think we must have a laundry list of various uh, alternatives which need to be looked at. So we have... yeah, I, I fully I fully agree with you. Uh, let's let's uh, uh, Deepika ji, if 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 I'm allowed one more question, <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, besides what Professor Vasne talked about uh, so so much in detail, if Mr. Jain is around, uh, if if he can uh, you know elaborate on this agroforestry thing, visible to do it across. Because that's not something uh, which which can be uh, a blanket recommendation. What, what is your opinion on that? I just so want to know. If I that. may just uh, intervene, because uh, about your earlier question, I just wanted to add something before I request uh, Abhishek to uh, respond. I just wanted to make two points. Uh, you know, I'm an expert in this area, but I've been following developments in the on the system of rice intensification in particular for a while. Uh, I think one of the things we should not miss out is the need to have India specific kinds of uh, calculations. So I think that in the dairy sector, for instance, uh, you know, we have to make a distinction between industrialized modes of production versus a household mode of production and estimate the difference in methane emissions from these. I think these international calculations may not apply in the same manner in the Indian context. I would say the same thing would apply even with regard to, uh, you know, methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions. So in the SRA case, while methane comes down significantly, there is an increase in nitrous oxide, but the overall indication seems to be that SRI seems to be favorable. We are doing more research in Indonesia and other places rather than in the Indian context. So early, earlier last month in 
uh, Hyderabad, the Indian Institute of Rice Research had an international conference on the system of crop intensification. Uh, I guess there are some papers on this. Dr. Mahinder Kumar, uh, I've been suggesting, he could also share some of these ideas. The, the point is, there are enough sites where these can also be done, not just on in the research laboratories, but actually on farmers' fields in collaboration with civil society organizations. So I think this multi-locational trials with a very clear scientific, uh, you know, kind of uh, insights, protocols, well designed, will give us much, much more insights to understand the phenomenon better in different kinds of environment. And there is no uh, disagreement on the fact that the ecological footprint of, um, you know, rice has to come down when we are exporting rice. We are probably in this current situation exporting a lot of water in some sense in terms of its consumption and the ecological footprint is high. So. Um, there is a significant scope in looking at alternatives and maybe greater scientific evidence can lead this discussion. Uh, and I would think that it would be helpful to take on more, more of these trials. And um, you know, the National Consortium on SRI would be happy to collaborate with any such initiative and build on the momentum that we recently had as part of the International Conference on System of Crop Intensification. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if I may now quickly come in, uh, Dr. Kumar's uh, question. Uh, uh, first of all, Dr. Kumar, that's a very good question because that's exactly the problem we are trying to solve right now. Uh, so I'll be happy to chat uh, for longer as well, but uh, very briefly. So there was uh, just uh, before the pandemic, uh, FAO did one study in India, uh, which talked about the suitability uh, of uh, various areas, relative suitability of various areas in the country for agroforestry. Uh, and we are actually trying to now improve that uh, first assessment that they have done because uh, we see like there are few broad stroke assumptions in there. So we are trying to, uh, in consultation with them, trying to improve it. Uh, so, I mean, one, uh, even a district level recommendation that, okay, these are the plant species that you can have in this particular district is not really uh, worthwhile. Uh, the recommendations need to be a lot more granular than that. Uh, so we are looking at a, 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer grid uh, and trying to even go further granular. Uh, so species vary uh, and accordingly the viability of the agroforestry also varies. Uh, that how much would be the economic return for the farmer uh, in order, uh, I mean, once they adopt a certain uh, kind of things. Uh, so uh, there are so certain areas where it is, uh, I mean, most species are going to be unviable, uh, especially, I mean, the more slopey the areas are, the lesser the viability is, etc. Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, extreme northern uh, northern parts of the country and uh, some other parts. But then so, the whole Indo-Gangetic plain, uh, highly viable. Uh, but uh, which uh, species you do at that granular local level, only that would determine farm out of farm the viability. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about like what we are trying to do there. We are also looking at beyond uh, just the active farmland, but also fellow farmlands, uh, some of the commons in the villages as well, uh, to look at different approaches that can come in so that grazing land also remains there because uh, that is also a need. But at the same time, we are able to capture more carbon, even those rangelands and grazing land. Yeah. Uh, I'm not giving you a very precise answer because that really varies from 25 kilometer to 25 kilometer, but I hope this gives you a sense of direction. Yeah. I know, I know it's a big topic. So thank you for, you know, coming back on this. Uh, I just wanted to highlight this. Thanks. Thanks for responding. Okay. Thank you. So I think uh, we have uh, any more questions from our audience or any issues that uh, would uh, one would like to really explore further. If not, then I will request uh, Ms. Sony to move a formal vote of thanks to all the participants and uh, the members of the audience who have joined the webinar and contributed to the discussion this afternoon. So, Professor Vasne, I just wanted to add that all these issues which have been raised internally for all the speakers here today. Uh, in addition to that, you know, online there are a lot of uh, questions which people have also forwarded to me. I think we'll put them together and then share with all the concerned people and maybe also uh, take up these uh, questions as uh, Professor Mitra talked about in Guwahati meet uh, yes. th that can be discussed in more in detail. Yes. yes. So I look forward to this uh, good discussion as we as we go ahead. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Uh, I, I from on behalf of Ixa Foundation, I thank you all the speakers, distinguished speakers, invitees, and participants for taking their time out for this session for a wonderful webinar and enlightening us with their thoughts and ideas. And I also uh, welcome you all for the event at uh, IIT Guwahati on 1st of February, IIT Guwahati. And I thank you for everyone. Thank you very much. 1st of March, 1st of February, not April. 1st of, uh, of, of February. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish to thank all our distinguished uh, speakers as well as our distinguished audience for making this discussion worthy of spending time. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks again, Professor.